A lot of the times researchers and research studies are conducted with small, very specific groups of people. And when we do that work, we typically find really cool things. But as soon as we scale that work and say, okay, how does this work in the broader populace? A lot of our findings go right out the window. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice, where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now as you know, we're taking a journey through my new book, 10 Things Schools Get Wrong and How We Can Get Them Right. So this week I want to take a look at chapter 2, which is called Evidence, The Problem with Translation. Now in this chapter we take a deep look at the idea of evidence and scientific research and what impact can that truly have on teaching and learning practices within schools. And we find that this issue of translation, moving knowledge between the laboratory and the classroom, is incredibly difficult and fails far more often than it succeeds. So the article I've selected this week that kind of aligns with that is called Scaling Up Behavioral Science Interventions in Online Education by Kizilcek and Colleagues. Now this paper concerns MOOCs. Massive online open community learning systems. These are things like edX and Coursera, where courses that were traditionally delivered just in university settings are now open to anyone anytime they want to learn for free. And over the last couple decades, millions of people from literally every country in the world have signed up for these MOOCs to learn. But there's been a problem. Most people sign up and start MOOCs but the vast majority never finish those MOOCs. In fact, worldwide, statistics suggest that only 5% of people ever finish MOOCs. But for a long time, they've been saying, okay, how do we get kids to complete these online courses? And several years ago, a group of researchers did small scale pilot studies where they incorporated behavioral science interventions at the start of each class to see if that would improve completion rates. And in the small scale studies, they found some good effects. So in this paper, what they did is they said, Let's scale it up. So what they did was over the course of two and a half years, every online course offered by Harvard, MIT, or Stanford included one of these behavioral science interventions at the beginning of the course. So just to give you some numbers, 269,000 students enrolled from 247 different countries. So this is a huge subject pool to see, can we use behavioral science to get people to finish their online learning? Now the behavioral interventions they used, there were five of them they chose. The first was called long planning. What are your dreams for the future and how might this course help you achieve them? The next is what we'll call short planning. What is your goal for this week of learning and how are you going to go about achieving that? Now the third intervention was called value relevance. This is where individuals write down their personal values and they discuss how the material they're learning from the course is going to meet, resonate, and help them build upon those values. The fourth intervention was called mental contrasting. And here students think about all the barriers they might hit that would stop them from completing the course and they organize in advance ways they're gonna address these barriers. And the fifth intervention was called social accountability. This is where people ask friends, families, colleagues to periodically check in with them to see how they're doing. So again, these interventions were put at the beginning of each course, and over the course of two and a half years, kids would do this intervention, then go through a MOOC, and they wanted to see would this help completion rates. And what did they find? Well, I'm just gonna read directly from the paper. The long-term planning prompts did not improve course completion. The short-term planning prompts did not improve course completion. The value relevance intervention did not improve course completion. The mental contrasting intervention did not improve course completion. And the social accountability intervention did not improve course completion rates. Yes, nothing seemed to make a dent. And from this, we can learn some very important things. First has to do with kind of research and application. A lot of the times researchers and research studies are conducted with small, very specific groups of people. And when we do that work, we typically find really cool things. But as soon as we scale that work and say, okay, how does this work in the broader populace? A lot of our findings go right out the window. In fact, this is a big issue we've been having right across all of sciences called the replication crisis. A lot of work done with small groups, pilot studies seemed to work great 20 years ago, but as soon as we scale it up and say, all right, let's do it with different people, more people, people from different countries, everything seems to go away. So this should serve as a reminder that research is constrained. It's largely based on the context within which it's completed. And once you open it up to the broader world, things can go haywire. Which brings us to the big point, I think, from papers like this, context matters. Now, drawing this back to education and learning, a lot of research is being shoved at you left and right, saying, oh, do this, cognitive science says do this, visible learning says do this, Marzano says do this. These are all based on research, and that's all fantastic, but you then gotta ask, okay, 
how was that research conducted and was it ever scaled? And you can't be shocked if something that did work in a laboratory way over here doesn't work in your classroom because your context, your unique students just doesn't fit with that intervention. So this is why that concept of a one size fits all doesn't make sense in education. You as teachers, you know it better than anyone else. You've got to move, you've got to adapt, you've got to be flexible. And anyone who says do it this way, it's going to work maybe once or twice, but it ain't going to work every time in the long run. So you've got to use that as a tool in your toolkit, but you've got to have dozens more tools to choose from to match different circumstances, which I think leads to the second concept of digital learning and MOOCs. For decades now, people have been saying MOOCs are going to take over for teachers. And here we see, no, it's not. And in order to get people to engage with the learning to conclusion requires a lot of on the fly movement, a lot of reading of situations, a lot of interventions that come just in time. Unfortunately, most MOOCs and digital systems aren't great at this. This is the human aspect where we can read and interact with our students and through our relationships with them, figure out who's where and what they need and drive accordingly. So as you can see, this translation process, moving knowledge from research into practice is incredibly difficult. Luckily, there is a process, there is a means to make it easier to help us as teachers actually do this translation. And that's what we take a look at in chapter two of this book. Why is the translation process so difficult and what do we have to do to make it easier? So I hope you all got something good from that. I hope you're all well and I'll see you guys soon. Bye y'all.